There's a concept that exists within the critical text movement that claims people who are scholarly in the fields of textual criticism don't need to be saved, but their findings are purely scientific and neutral. So the atheistic concepts of Bart Ehrman may be disliked by many who favor the critical text, but they'll still follow many of his conclusions about manuscripts, scribal habits, and, and so on. So in my previous video, I asked the question, why the so-called conservative apologists allow those within modern biblical academies to continue without any judgment. They can be heretical, liberal, agnostic, atheistic, Mormon, Catholic, um, but they never seem to get the critiques or the scorn that many conservative Texas Receptus or King James Version defenders get. You won't find James White, for example, doing a program on you know, Carlo Martini, who's a Jesuit, who is in line to be a Pope, for example. You know, you, you just won't find that. You won't find Mark Ward um, talking about George Vance Smith and talking about the, the Unitarian influence uh, in the Bible Society, how the Bible Society was, is basically became the Unitarian Bible Society after the Trinitarian Bible Society started. So one glaring example of a theologian being anti-biblical is Gerhard Kittel. Now you may know of or even own a copy of Kittel's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. It's very popular still today. Uh, Kittel was the son of Old Testament professor Rudolf Kittel, so we won't get those two guys confused. But he was an expert on Judaism of the Old Testament period and produced Kittel's Biblia Hebraica. This edition was superseded by the Biblia Hebraica Stuttgartensia. So Gerhard Kittel's father, Rudolf Kittel, spent his life working on Old Testament Hebrew literature that shaped the critical Old Testament text that we have today. The Old Testament Biblia Hebraica is the foundation of every modern Bible translation, um, coupled with the Nestle Island Greek. Um, including the Jewish New Testament. So, you know, there might be a few out there, you know, based upon the Aramaic text and things like that, but this is, you know, the most popular ones, ESV, NIV, New Revised Standard Version. They, these Bibles are based upon these texts. So the Old Testament text was done by Rudolf Kittel. So Gerhard Kittel and his father, Rudolf, are responsible for what has become the two most eminent works in theology over the past century. So I want you to understand that the impact that these guys have had on the Old Testament. So Gerhard Kittel was born in 1888. He was a German Protestant theologian. During World War I, Kittel served as a Navy chaplain. In 1917, he taught privately at Leipzig until 1921. He became associate uh, professor um, in 1921. During the course of 1921, he was also called to become a professor at a Griswold in the New Testament department, where he stayed until 1926. He later took over the chair of Adolf Schattler in Tübingen. While at Tübingen, he conducted several studies and published articles covering research comparing the history and ancient religion of ancient Judaism and Palestinian early Christianity. At that time, he expressed that he was less interested in the racial or political questions, but rather in the religious relationship between Israel, Judaism, and Christianity. In 1933, he took over the new ed edition of the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. That's the famous one. Um, it's on Amazon today. You can buy it. And uh, he took that over from Herman Kremer and Julius Kogel. So it sounds pretty normal so far. He's an academic guy and he's a smart guy. He's got a lot of followers. And uh, um, so he's writing this theological dictionary. Gerhard Kittel joined the Nazi party in the May of 1933 when they seized power. With the publication of his article, The Question of the Jews, in 1933, Kittel became involved with the Nazi exclusion policy 
of the Jewish population to the voice disagreement of both Jewish and Christian leaders. Herbert Lewewi, a Cambridge University professor, wrote this to Kittle in August 1933. It gives me great pain to find so great an authority and leader of thought should give expression to such views. I have read your previous works with pleasure and profit and have learned much from them. Your present pronouncement is quite incompatible with your previous teaching and it is as unjust to Christianity as it is to Judaism. It is a grievous disillusionment to find that one's idol has feet of clay. In 1935, Kittle became one of the founding fathers of the Government Institute for the History of the New Germany, which was a supposedly scientific body charged with the justification of the Nazi regime's anti-Semitic policies. He was an active contributor to the work of the sector involved with the Jewish question. In 1936, he also worked for the Munich branch of the Research Institute of the Jewish question. From the autumn of 1935 to April 1943, he held the chair of the theology department in Vienna. One theologian who worked with Kittle said, as a collaborator on his dictionary for over a year, I learned that Kittle is one of the most cunning theological businessmen of our time. His pacts with the Deutsch Christen in all respects has been a difficult challenge for us. He goes on to say that his lecture served as scientific underpinnings for the present policies toward the Jews. Kittel has thereby helped these policies and therefore made the evangelical theology partly liable therefore. He wrote Nazi influenced articles about Christianity and until his disclosure or um, or conversion to anti-Semitism, who, who knows which came first, he had been a well-respected scholar. He was so well-respected that secular and Christian liberals within the academy denied or obscured his Third Reich work until Robert P. Erickson published a book on Kittle, Theologians Under Hitler, in 1985. And this made such liberal denialism no longer possible. And so people were denying that he had anything to do with the Nazis. He's just, he's just a scholar. We use his work, you know. <laughs> he's he's anti-Semitic. He's publishing things against the Jews. And so <laughs> this gets worse, guys. Listen to this. So Hitler wanted Kittle to make a new German Bible. Um, so this new Bible translation would replace Martin Luther's Bible, which at the time most Germans used Martin Luther's Bible at the time. It's probably the 1910 edition, I think, that, that was the latest one. Kittel wrote a 10-volume biblical Greek lexicon, Kittel's Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. If you just Google that, you'll see it's, it's for sale everywhere. The first seven volumes um, were written while Kittel was Hitler's Minister of Propaganda, while the last three volumes of his Biblical Greek lexicon were done while he was in jail for war crimes against the Jews. Yes, he was in jail for war crimes. So after the Second World War, Kittel was jailed for his Nazi war crimes. During his war crimes trial, Kittel claimed that his acts were imposed on him by God. And Gerhard Kittel argued that agreement with the state and with the Fuhrer was obedience toward the law of God. Um, Kittel was a charter member of um, the National Socialist Institute for the History of the New Germany. And he gave his expertise and reputation to the research section on the Jewish question from 1936 onward. In 1947, J.R. Porter, he's a theologian, praises Kittle's profound biblical scholarship with no reference at all to his unseemingly um, political position with the Nazis. German historians have shown little interest in Kittle, 
but his self-proclaimed role as theological expert on the Jewish question has made him an important figure, especially under the Nazi regime. I mean, um, it's bad enough that today someone would say things that are anti-Semitic and, you know, often hate is brought upon them. But this guy seems to have been forgotten <laughs> and he was actually jailed for Nazi war crimes and he were, his reputation as a, as a New Testament scholar, um, it helped the Nazis propagate their propaganda. So there's very little evidence that Kittle experienced a change of heart prior to 1945, prior to, to his capture. Despite the abundant evidence available to him to correct his misunderstanding. Kittle produced a body of work between 1933 and 1944 filled with hatred and slander toward Jews and was warmly supportive of the National Socialist anti-Jewish policies. He published studies depicting the Jewish people as the historical enemy of Germany, Christianity and European culture in general. Now, I understand that there are people today who can get falsely labelled as anti-Semitic. You know, some people are critical of the secular government of Israel and things that they do, and straight away, anti-Semitic, especially, you know, evangelical Christians tend to be hyper pro-Zionism. I'm not talking about that sort of thing. This guy, he was helping the Nazi, he was a Nazi, he was helping the Nazis, and he was writing tracts about the Jews. So in 1933, he spoke for the stripping of citizenship from German Jews their removal from medicine, law, teaching and journalism, and to forbid marriage or sexual relations with non-Jews, thus anticipating by two years the Nazi government, which introduced its Nuremberg racial laws and took away Jewish rights from German citizenship in 1935. So he was two years ahead of the Nazis. So he, he was helping the Nazis. He knew what the Nazis were going to do. Kitter was named as an official theologian by the Nazi party. And the Nazis often appealed to some of his works as an excuse for their anti-Semitic eugenic policies. So Gerhard Kittel was linked to one of the worst war crimes in history. He had a reputation uh, as an accurate New Testament scholar and he brought that into the Nazi party which gave the Nazi party weight. He would talk about the persecution of the Jews and um, his father had a lot of weight uh, having worked on the Old Testament. And so these guys um, had, had, this, had this weight with them. And so uh, Gerhard Kittel, the son, he's used this weight to come against the Jews and commit one of the worst crimes against humanity, humanity that's ever happened. And so this is just another clear example of how um, theologians, academics, who seemingly are neutral, can have a huge influence in the world. So I've used this as an example for modern biblical scholars, especially those who work in the field of textual criticism. You know, many times these people are liberals, they're Catholics, they're, you know, I mean, it won't be long, I guess, before we have Jehovah's Witnesses on there. We've already had Unitarians and things like that. And these guys, they seemingly look neutral, but behind the scenes, they have all this baggage. Now, why aren't the apologists of today exposing these people?